The Direct Orient Express has a sound of magic to its name, but by 1967, it's a very poor version of its former self. Starting at Paris's Gare de Lyon at 11.50 in the evening, two wagon lee sleepers and three further first and second class coaches go through to Istanbul four days a week and Athens three. The route is via France, Switzerland, Italy, Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. The coaches being tacked onto so-called express trains in each country. The journey takes three nights and almost three days and there's no dining car from the Swiss border until you get to Turkey or Greece. So the journey can be somewhat of a marathon if you're not prepared. And in this form, the train has a decade of life left. The first possible site of any steam is in Italy. And this will be rare 280 number 740045, seen just outside Milan on shunting duty. And this plus the odd 260 will be all that can be found. The scenery here, and indeed for most of the journey beyond Switzerland, is unexciting. But there are a few compensations, such as Mussolini's fine palace of a station in Milan Centrale. This station built as an outward and visible sign of the dictator's power to improve the then chaotic rail services in Italy is certainly impressive, with its great curved roof and magnificent concourse. But these factors are not the vital ones for the direct Orient passengers. They need to think about food, for there will be little, if anything, available once Italy has been left behind, and there's now no dining car. The station vendors are pressing in their sales of dolls, but better to walk down to the buffet trolley and stock up with cheese, bread, ham and wine. There's plenty, and it's cheap enough. The next stop is Venice, then in the evening, the border at Trieste, ready for the dullness of Yugoslavia. The morning brings the approaches to Belgrade and almost certainly some Yugoslav steam on freights and the usual passenger trains. The train stops at most stations and the approaches to towns of any size are grim, with blocks of stereotype flats constructed as far as the eye can see. In the rain they look particularly spartan. Belgrade station can produce a form of refreshment trolley, but it's only dry biscuits, Yugo cola and a form of Yugo coffee. The platforms are not the cleanest in the world either. As the express is about to leave, there's a piece of good fortune, the arrival of a local behind a Yugoslav Pacific, the class of engine which will take the direct orient on its final leg out of that country into Bulgaria. The lack of a platform does not seem to worry the local people, who to send bag and baggage onto the tracks. In a moment, the express is away, passing a small tank engine shunting. From now on until Greece, photography is forbidden by order of the guardians of the people's liberty, in other words, the train's policemen. Next morning, it's Greece and Volos in the rain, passing the standard gauge shed as the train runs in. But even in this awful weather, Volos, halfway up the east coast from Athens, is intriguing and satisfying. How many places in the world are there with three different gauges and steam on each one of them, and the mass of fishing boats crowded up to the sides of the road and rail? We leave the standard gauge behind to look at the harbour shunt, which is performed by a metre gauge 260 tank built by Toubiz in 1921. One of three similar locos kept for the job.
The passenger service westwards across the plains to Kelampaca is run by modern rail cars manufactured by Breda of Italy, dating from 1951. These even carry a small bar. There is, however, a daily mixed train in each direction using steam, probably a 262 tank with four-wheeled stock, where the peculiar toilet facilities are provided in a covered van with a partition across it at one end to provide a cubicle with Asiatic-type apparatus. But most passengers use the rail car, which runs right into the main street. It's fast, clean and handy. The rail cars have conventional buffers and can be used to tow a trailer or maybe an extra van. The livery, blue and grey with a yellow lining, hardly visible in this awful weather. Hiding away in the loco shed, sadly out of use today, is an ex-Brunig Railway 060 tank by Winterthur. Its empty cylinders for the rack gear a reminder of its mountainous past. But there is something even more rewarding that runs through the main street of Volos. And it's steam too. The nominal two-foot gauge line, actually 60 centimetres, runs eastwards, scaling the sides of Pelion, some 18 miles to the little town of Millet. It starts its journey in the forecourt of the mainline station, but soon runs through the harbour, passing over the multi-gauge tracks used by standard and narrow-gauge rail cars. In spite of its tram-like appearance, the train is well used, as it's extremely cheap. Like a tram or a rail car, the train seems to stop almost by request as it trundles along the main street, the only use this far along of the mixed gauge. The railway has two engines in everyday use, both 260 tanks carrying names. Number 101 Millet, built by two bees of Belgium in 1908, and number 102 Jason, a younger brother by Elne Saint-Pierre in 1912. Each carries an oval number and works plate. Traffic is sparse. There's only one return journey from each terminus every day. The competing bus service has seen to that. Most passengers seem to be either railwaymen or country folk living round the upper sections of the line, which have no roads available to heavy motor vehicles. Likewise, there's little or no freight, and certainly no separate freight trains, goods being taken in the vans attached to the passenger train. In contrast with its larger neighbour, the Millet line uses bogey coaches, albeit one class only, with longitudinal wooden seating. There's no first class. There are a couple of passing loops in the main street, and these are the official stopping places. With traffic and trains as sparse as they are today, these are really anachronisms. Unusually for a minuscule European railway, the train staff is in use to regulate the single line working. Normally these lines seem to be run on the principle of God and the telephone. The journey in each direction for the 18 miles is normally well over two hours, even coming back when it's downhill from Millet. The next actual station is at Anno Laconia, seven and a half miles out of Volos, and from here the line changes from a roadside tramway to a railway in its own right, but until then it runs only a few feet above sea level, adjacent to the road round the bay. The whole affair is a relic of past days when railways were the only form of public transport available, bar horse-drawn traffic, and the line to Millet is very much a living museum piece without the sometimes unreal trappings which go with working preservation today. <laughs> 